We are recording. Let's kick off this incredible session with such uh, a wonderful uh, group of panel experts today. Um, so welcome to Regional Arts New South Wales third panel session of the Country Air. The Country Air is presented by Regional Arts New South Wales and it's a monthly on online discussion panel on the key issues facing arts and culture in regional Australia. The Country Air aims to directly engage with people living and working in regional New South Wales and beyond across Australia. So today we are Wednesday the 19th of October 2022. It's 6 p.m. summertime in New South Wales or 5 p.m. in Queensland for those that are calling in from Queensland. My name is Dr Sally Blackwood and I'm your host for this evening's third Country Air panel. And we're gonna discuss arts and cultural recovery in a time of change. And I can't tell you how prescient this is to talk about today. Today, I'm calling in from Darug country. So to audio describe myself, I'm sitting in a wooden paneled room. There's a door behind me and I'm dressed in navy blue. I have pale skin and blondish hair that's slightly out of control. A little bit of housekeeping as we start. Um, we are recording, as you may have seen, uh, so that audiences will be able to access this discussion online after the event. So please, if you don't want to, wish to be filmed, please feel free to turn this off. We recognise that people also have varying internet ability, uh, and this is even more so uh, tonight with the pending weather conditions across New South Wales and especially and, and Victoria, especially in this weather prone time. So some of the panel members may yeah, yeah. Need to turn their um, cameras off. We encourage participation. Um, and we... Endless curiosity and passion for learning more. Oh, thank you. Inspiring. I wonder why I've lost the sound. Let's all just keep our uh, microphones off for now. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, However, we do encourage participation. So we'd really love you to write any questions into the chat box um, and comments. Um, the icons are located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and please feel free to jump on, as I said, and say hi and what country you're calling in from. Um, and if you experience any technical issues, also put that in the chat box, that'd be fantastic. Managing the chat box in today's session is Regional Arts New South Wales CEO, Dr. Tracy Callanan. Hello, Tracy. Um, and Tracy's gonna feed in a chat summary and questions at different intervals this evening. So the panel session will go for an hour and we'll conclude New South Wales time at 7 p.m. In a moment, uh, I will introduce the esteemed panelists and then kick off the discussion with some prepared questions. Before I introduce you to our speakers and lead you through the conversation, I would first like to conduct uh, an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge that we are all gathered today across New South Wales and Australia, across various First Nations countries on land that has never been ceded. I thank the custodians of this country story and song lines and remind myself to always tread gently like the Darug Biryabin or the Gamilarai Dinuan or soft-footed emu of many lands and let's all tread gently. Today's discussion, arts and cultural recovery in a time of change. So let me introduce you to our panel. I'm going to start with Scotia Mankovic who's Executive Officer of Creative Network, sorry, Creative Recovery Network. Uh, Scotia is based in Queensland. Scotia advocates for the role of the arts and creativity in disaster preparedness, responsiveness and recovery nationally. So the Creative Recovery Network aims to gather, critique, develop and share knowledge for engagement of the arts in disaster recovery, along with developing tools and support for artists working in the field. Scotia is a leading community arts cultural development practitioner with major programs and partnerships developed and and with national and international communities, organisations and government. Scotia is committed to artistic and executive collaborations and partnerships, creating art experiences that change the way people see their and others' lives. Welcome, Scotia. Thanks, Sally. 
Jane Fuller is the Executive Director of Arts Northern Rivers. Jane's experience spans over 25 years. She's held senior roles with small, medium, large interdisciplinary arts organisations. Jane has a history of engagement in, in intersection of arts, culture and development recreation. So with creative industries and with government. She's a creative producer who draws from a depth of experience, which includes directing organisations, programs, events, strategy, and making space for audiences, artists, and community to connect and be creative, active, and social. Jane's body of work goes from uh, Ubud uh, Readers and Writers Festival, Boomerang Festival, Norpa, APAN, Black Dance, um, City Festival, Hong Kong, Vital Statistics, and many more. Welcome, Jane. And our third panellist is Sandy McNaughton. She's the Recovery Support Officer of the National Emergency Management Agency. Um, originally from Melbourne, Sandy spent the last 20 years living on a property near Delung at Delungra, which is near Inverell. Sandy has extensive experience in the development and delivery of regional community uh, capacity building projects uh, as and as a manager of the Roxy Theatre in Bingra and as director of Northwest Film Festival. Currently working as a recovery support officer, Sandy channels her arts management experience into assisting communities impacted with disaster. These roles and her experience living and working in rural communities have provided her with excellent understanding of important role of arts and culture and what it plays in the recovery process and the vital need to put adequate support around artists practicing in communities impacted by disasters. Welcome, Sandy. Thanks, lovely to be here. Thank you all. This is a really phenomenal um, recovery panel of experts. So the discussion, arts and cultural recovery in a time of change. Regional Australia has been at the forefront of coping with national, um, natural disasters and the effects of climate change. The art sector is impacted by all of these events, but also has a role in recovery of communities. So the panel is going to delve into what it looks like and why the arts need to be more recognised for its part in preparedness of, for disaster and assisting communities to recover. Um, the panel will examine challenges facing regional Australia, such as natural disasters, mental health isolation and others. And tonight, timing is everything. Speaking on recovery this evening and earlier today, uh, Sandy McNaughton um, was saying to me that the minister, when the minister for emergency services flies into Gunnedah, Gamilaroi country, we all know that something is up. So we've had major storm warning predictions over the next few days, right now, the next few days, and further possible major flooding. So in Varel, Moree, Narrabri have had warnings and sandbags are being prepared. So it's pretty relentless. That sets the scene a little bit of where we are. But I'd like to look at the really bigger picture for a start. So Scotia, I'm going to throw to you to, to open up this discussion. What challenges are our regional communities currently facing? Uh, thanks, Sally. I'll just introduce myself. I'm joining you tonight from Mianjin, uh, Brisbane on Yagara Tourable Country. Uh, it's pretty wet here at the moment, like everywhere else currently. I, um, I'm in my home. I have a very busy wall behind me, um, but I have blue glasses and I've got a, my hair is blonde. Um, I call it the uh, the 80s throwback haircut mullet <laughs> currently my holiday in into my youth <laughs> and uh, I have um, pale skin so the bigger picture and what challenges well we all live in those challenges and I can't uh, say I ever call myself an expert in this field I'm certainly one that's constantly learning and I've been focusing in the the place of uh, disaster management for the last 10 or so years since the 2011 floods in Queensland. So interesting, we're turning around into this national wide flooding scenarios that we're, we're facing at the moment. But um, 
uh, you know, we are, we, we are in a time of change. We are living uh, the climate change. And I think the reality of that is what we're seeing and living through currently. And uh, in some ways, that's the biggest uh, change for our communities and for ourselves individually leading forward. But it's also one of the greatest opportunities that we have in terms of coming around common goals. And I think... Um, Often when we talk about climate change, it's within this uh, frenzy of, of fear and unknowns. And it is a fear and unknown, but it's also an opportunity for us to really cement down and understand our values and our importance as community and to re-imagine uh, ways that we're going to be collaborating into the future. I think one of the biggest challenges in that space, certainly from a national perspective and hearing and following the stories and experience of, of people um, on the ground, such as Jane and her, her communities and Sandy's communities, and many of you on the screen today, is the, um, the kind of uh, tension and challenge between the role that community members have and the role that the emergency management sector itself is taking on or needs to take on. And we've seen a lot of that, particularly coming out of the floods earlier this year from the Northern Rivers region and the Queensland regions that were impacted. And it's certainly not a new story. There's a lot of um, uh, process around the investigation post the fires, 2019, 20 fires too, in terms of where this disconnect is occurring in terms of the roles that communities step into comparatively to the roles that are there supposedly being supported by our service providers and our government. And um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a place where there's a lot of um, finger pointing and, and tension and anger, as, as you can imagine. But it need, uh, what, what is really required and the, and the challenge for us moving forward is to find out ways that we can open up spaces where we can have these really difficult conversations, where we can all, in some ways, step um, out of our our uh, what might we call it our uniforms or our positions and to acknowledge that we all have to be vulnerable in, in saying that we can't actually we can't actually sit in this space of response on our own we have to be looking at where we collaborate and that government don't have all the answers but nor do community have all the answers but we have the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that feed um, the potential for us to live safely into the future and we just need to be able to acknowledge what what the strength of our piece is and where it fits with everyone else. And I think that's a really uh, big point of systems change that we, we need to be addressing. And there's conversations about it, but currently the action around it is uh, fairly cont uh, it con contentious and it's highly political and therefore even more difficult for us to jump in. Um, just in, in, a, in responding back to what your introduction was, Sally, like we're also in a, po a point of, really uh, compounding impacts um, with this event that's unfolding over the last week and this week uh, on top of um, the early floods, on top of COVID, on top of fires, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone, and we all know personally, we sit in a very weary space. And again, one of the challenges moving forward is what, what are the processes and mechanisms that we have to care for each other uh, and to have opportunities for reinvigoration? Uh, of energy and vision and capacity. And again, I think that's something that we uh, in the creative sector uh, can play a real role in looking at containers of care and re-energizing and, and looking at the emotions of, of people and a way to unpack those in, a, in, a, in safety in order to recharge the batteries. I think, um, yeah, it's, di it's difficult and a long road. And I know uh, Jane and Sandy would be uh, much more pertinent to talk about this, the long road ahead. These, these impacts might be in the short term, but they are held in our communities and in our skins for a very long time. So again, the challenge moving forward is how do we look at longevity and how do we look at legacy from these small opportunities where we get you know, in essence, financial support to do programs to feed into a bigger picture of ongoing preparedness and, and capacity building. And I think one of the biggest um, pieces of work that we're trying to engage, and certainly we're having conversations at a, at a government level, uh, to, is to look at how do we feed 
culture and the arts into that longer term picture and how do we see uh, legacy being impacted rather than reactionary uh, processes and programs so that response programs that we're developing now are feeding into ongoing uh, community preparedness, feeding into ongoing community leadership and legacy so that we're not constantly reinventing the wheel or trying to catch up with ourselves, but we're embedding strong relationships and strong connections that will hold us into what is um, an unknown future. Thank you so much, Scotia. There's so much in what you've said. Um, I would like to go to Jane now and with two thoughts in mind. Um, one, the idea of this, this connect between uh, community and emergency management um, and, and that idea of systemic change and also the idea of a roadmap and preparedness ahead. Jane, you're based in the Northern Rivers. Um, you experience the Lismore floods firsthand. What role has arts and culture had in your community's recovery? Thanks, Sally. Um, I'll audio describe myself. I've got a white background of nothing, uh, pretty much. I've got, um, I'm wearing green and a scarf and a pair of glasses. Uh, and I'm pale skin, blotchy, really. Um, so I think it's hard for me because, like Scotia said, I don't see myself an expert in creative recovery, emergency management, even socially engaged practice. You know, my whole working life has been around working in the arts and cultural sector, uh, you know, looking at audiences' behaviour, looking at artists' needs, looking at career development, professional development opportunities, um, the funding landscape to sort of keep a kind of contemporary arts, um, you know, part of the contemporary arts sector in, in Australia, looking at markets, international markets, as well as local. So for me to sort of talk about um, emergency uh, community and emergency management, I've only, you know, because I was at the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, you know, during the floods and the 2017 floods and the 2019 fires is kind of, you know, I, I think um, I'm, our response really, as, <coughs> as, you know, when I look at Arts Northern Rivers, which I'm a part of, uh, you know, we're a RADO, John's on the line, another RADO and Arts, uh, Arts Upper Hunter, is, you know, we, we, we you know, we lost our office, um, uh, my team, small team of five, you know, three of them lost houses, cars and and a family member. But um, so it was, it was just we found ourselves, myself and another team member, going, what can we do? And, um, and I think I look back at it now and go, it really had to break down into kind of immediate medium and long-term view. And that's how we broke it down. And the immediate was looking at how we could help artists, i.e. find out and connect with everyone, reach out, give them a, a sort of central space to, or a central organisation to connect with, to find out what services were available. If they were indeed able to access services, we were trying to gather that information. When it came to reaching out to emergency services and things that I've never had to think about before, honestly, I, I, I just knew I had to reach out beyond the art sector, so beyond the normal you know, create New South Wales or OSCO or regional arts. I had to reach out to, and that's when I formed a relationship with Sandy McNaughton, who's on this, this webinar as well. And that then changed my view and understanding that we then could get support, you know, and support breeds support. So uh, the more we reached out to artists and what they were going through, uh, the more and and the more we reached out to 
people outside our sector, the more we were able to gather. And I think that's probably what Scotia was getting at as well, was, you know, connection, networking became absolutely critical at that time of making connections. Um, so I guess in the medium, short to medium term is when we developed the forum. You might want me to talk about that a bit later. But... Um, and, and I think that sort of came after discussions I had with a whole lot of people around what could, what what do people need, and the number one thing they needed at that time was connection, uh, and that was immediate connection. I'm talking rapid, you know, um, finding out what. So we then that seeded the idea of bringing everyone together to have a forum so they could all have a voice as well as see and be together, you know, like Scotia said, the compounding impacts of bushfires, COVID, floods um, on this sector and many others, but on this sector is massive. Uh, and all of those things pushed everyone apart. You know, COVID made us go away from each other. We had to socially isolate. The fires was the same. I just remember seeing people packing up their horses and, you know, I know that there's people on this webinar that had to do that. And then the floods. So it felt like in recovery, in that immediate post-disaster, it felt like the most critical thing to do was enable, enable a space and a platform for people to come together. So not, you know, bring the break down the walls of separation and come together. And even and just to hear each other, lean on each other, and uh, and then look at each other, and then work out. Hang on, we we are a community. We can look at how to go forth. And I really want to make this differential: is that Arts Northern Rivers' approach was very much around supporting our artists uh, in in and the sector in recovery, as opposed to. Um, artists working in creative recovery and socially engaged. Uh, so we very much concentrated on what we had capacity to do and that was support the art sector to recover and we're still in that. Thank you so much, Jane. Can I add, um, Sally, that your question is kind of uh, provocative in itself because the recovery is a very long journey. And as Absolutely. Jane said, there's different stages of that. So it can't be looked at, oh, have they recovered? How has arts recovered the community? Because it's not possible to even imagine that as a beginning or an end uh, in the situation that those communities are currently going through. So there's a lot of work and it's slow work. And you know there are connections through Creative First Aid, for example, in Northern Rivers where this kind of beginnings of programs putting it into place more broadly as a connection into community. But it's a long journey. And part of that challenge is to maintain the energy. And um, in some That's ways, yeah. yeah, in some ways, it's interesting, Jane, you make the differentiation between artists and recovery and community. And I suppose from my perspective, I don't see such a delineation of the two. I think one feeds the other and vice versa. So interesting to unpack that further. Absolutely. Yeah, it would be. I think because, you know, there is, I guess, from an organisational capacity point of view, sure. um, there is a really clear line for us where we can focus and as, as a, you know, support organisation where we can focus our support because, you know, as an organisation, we're also damaged and in recovery. So we only have capacity for a certain amount and that is, I guess, like I said, giving artists you know, making sure we're out there doing major advocacy, do, finding opportunities for artists to, have, you know, like we don't want to have creative drain away from the region, you know, and have our artists and creatives, you know, not have the, you know, opportunities are gone for exhibitions, for having shows, for making a living. So, you know, we are doing everything we can to ensure that there's opportunities that we can now, I guess, prop up until the long term kind of we get bricks and mortar we get those essential civic centers and things back absolutely thank you jane and thank you scotia for jumping in there too because it is a, a provocation and and specifically so to find out what recovery is and what are we 
recovering from? Are we there yet? What does that mean? I mean, obviously, with everything that's going on, even today as we speak, um, there's so much um, that so much work still to be done. And Jane, you mentioned the, the exhaustion and the wanting to connect as a really important that connection as being really important. Um, you went on then to do the, the creative uh, uh, industry arts and creative industry recovery forum um i just like i know sandy was a part of that sandy can i just get you to jump in with a bit of a national perspective um and just look about look looking at um what does recovery look like and you know how what role does the arts play in recovery I'm going to audio describe myself and I do apologize. I feel very uncomfortable about having my camera on under the current weather conditions we're experiencing up here. So I'll, I'm imagining most of you can see I have a fairly shocking pair of blue glasses on. Um, I did put my hair up. I was trying to obviously doll myself up a little bit to make myself a bit more presentable living out here in the sticks. And I have a very plain background. I live in a very old homestead. Currently, there's a bucket with a leak. I uh, hope you can't hear that while I'm talking. But um, I will turn my camera off and attempt to answer that rather enormous question about recovery because so many communities are recovering from different types of circumstances and disasters in different ways. A lot of our communities are facing compounding disasters and may have been originally in severe drought, followed by bushfire, followed by COVID, followed by a flood, followed and had a mouse plague in between. So it's very difficult to, I suppose, again, be specific in terms of where we're talking about which recovery and the impact that's had on which community. But certainly in terms of the role that the arts plays, um, it is an extremely unique one. I'm going to make it very clear that I'm not a practicing artist, nor have I ever been. Um, I have had the opportunity to be involved in community arts practices and to be um, in an arts management and event role. But it's, it's my experience now that arts in these recovery roles leads the way to a new future. And in that sense of providing us with an insight or a vision of who we are and where we've come from and what we've been through, and more importantly, what we've lost, but also hopefully what we've also gained and certainly where we want to go and how we want to get there collectively. So we're obviously all connected to our environment and profoundly influenced by it. And this connection is manifested in artistic practice, no matter what the medium. And in my own experience, I can use the example of the Northwest Film Festival, which I was the director of for nearly 20 years. Um, depending on the circumstances, we received a number of entries from young people across the region, and I'm sure this is still continuing now, that the focus would be on what particular event and what, what particular disaster that communities were recovering from, that they would use those artistic mediums as an opportunity to articulate that experience. And this was really powerful because it was allowing the capacity for storytelling, which we know is so fundamental to the healing process. And I think it's a good example of affording an opportunity for people to, in our communities, who may not necessarily have ever considered engaging in cultural practice, but under the circumstances, they're compelled to want to express their experience in a way that can be shared with others. So it's fundamental that we're able to provide these opportunities for self-expression, for our thoughts and feelings and responses, because so often and frequently, it's our way of trying to process our loss and the dramatic change to our environment and to be able to start those conversations that allows us to connect through those shared experiences. It's also so vital to bring people together that provides that common ground and it's that commonality that provides the opportunity to heal, but it also brings us hope. So I think it provides a measure of hope while honoring what has been lost and I'm more and more confident that we are starting to recognise the critical role that arts play in recovery. Uh, Dr. Robert Gordon talks about the imprint of a traumatic experience being absorbed by the receptive part of our brains. But in order to process it, we need to move it into the expressive part of the brain. And this is the way the arts are so important to enable that expression to occur in whatever medium. And 
the sooner the expression can take place, the more beneficial it is in that healing process. So I think it's, it's very difficult to articulate what type of recovery, what successful recovery looks like. And that would be very much, again, because of the compounding nature and the inability of us to be able to, I think, really anchor ourselves and, and at loss of control in those anchor points that the ground has literally shifted beneath our feet. Um, so I think it's, it's, we are still very much in the recovery phase in large parts of the shires and the communities that I work around and in and in. And given the current conditions, I feel like we're, as everybody's aware, it's going to be a very long journey out the other side. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was um, beautifully articulate and made me think a lot about storytelling being so fundamental. And maybe that's something that either Scotia or Jane would like to pick up on in terms of how storytelling and vision can aid community recovery. Um, I, I'm not necessarily going to answer that, but I'm kind of interested and curious about this word recovery because it is splashed around a lot. Well, probably shouldn't use that word, but um, splash. But um, <laughs> it's a kind of interesting phenomenon. And again, I think this is where the shift is is having to be taken place because um, we are living in we are living in a part of a climate shift, and the notions of being able to recover from a singular event is no longer really a reality for our lived experience. So in some ways, maybe the term is uh, null and void now that we just, it's just about how we are going to continue to live within the container or the ecology that we're living in, which is, trauma, which is um, flexible and changing uh, repeatedly and, and constantly in terms of how we move forward with our lives as part of our communities in our, our, our own homes and certainly on the countries that we we live on. So to be able to say that we have recovered, um, I think is kind of mute now. Mute, it's no longer relevant to potentially use that language, even though that's the language of. Would you, what, what language would you use? Is, I'm, is I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'd be interested to know what Sandy and Jane think or other people on the line, but I, I think it's kind of a curious way that maybe if we're, we're continuing to look at, well, when's the line end? And the line ends uh, politically after two, maybe three years max in terms of the way that they're going to invest in this thing that they're calling recovery. And we know that that's not when it's finished. We know it goes on for a very long time from an incident of impact. But now we have these multiple instances, just part of a change in life. Do we need to be thinking about how we language it or have the narrative around living on country in a much more of a continuum? And I think about the way that um, our First Nations people talk about uh, being on country and the, long, the longevity of a narrative story that's continuous rather than segmented. And, you know, maybe we need to be thinking about it in a, a different way so that we can actually think about management and energy and ways of moving forward rather than having these kind of checkpoints along the way to make sure we're doing it right or that we've reached a certain point or... Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Sandy or Jane, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I was going to say that I feel that there is a really big shift that we're undergoing and it is constant change in, in government and the agencies, whether they're emergency response agencies or the federal or state governments. And an example would be the agency that I currently work for has changed significantly over the past two years since I started. And I think these changes are being implemented across all levels and all agencies in, a, in an attempt to better support and adapt and to be flexible and to recognise that, as Scotia mentioned, there is so much space for advocacy to ensure the role of arts and creative activity is recognised and embedded in national policy and our strategy and design because the principles of disaster recovery has shifted, I think, significantly and it's potentially looking more towards a uh, focus around disaster risk mitigation and disaster preparedness to build in that resilience. I'm not saying that we've got all the answers to doing that, but certainly there is no recovery without having a resilient community. So 
even in the past six months, I'm going to suggest there's been what I've observed a significant change more towards the risk mitigation and preparedness rather than the recovery. Thank you, Sandy. I think it's a really, it's a really important um, point of different th Thanks for bringing that up, Scotia, and how we are shifting. Uh, Scotia, you, you're inviting people to maybe put that in the chat box as well. I would love that if people have got different ideas of what of uh, a framework, a term, what they think uh, this could be, that would be wonderful to see. Um, I'm wondering, I, I sort of put down preparedness, I mean, resilience, Scotia, is it about being resilient or is it about I think, being I think malleable? I think that's a pretty difficult word too. And maybe, Jane, you've got some comment to make around how this language is being used locally. Right. Jane, that. do you want to jump in there? Yeah. Well, yeah, resilience is a dirty word, basically. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, like that. Tell us. Because it, the, the, it's so layered. I mean, it, 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 for, you know, you got to, for me, you break it down, you look at like, and, and I am looking at the art sector, yes, you know, always I'm going to go to storytelling, what Sandy talked about, storytelling is our history, it's our identity, we throw back, it's what the arts do best. Um and now artists are also asked to be uh, prepared, they're asked to repair, they're asked to be experts in resilience, you know, and they're asked to do all these other things uh, as well as be the, you know, the, the storytellers of our identity and our collective experience. So I think that, um, you know, out of the forum, artists were talking about, and I've got a few words here that they brought up that we drilled out from the forum, and it was repair, which underneath is supporting artists to get through that immediate and, and, and short term. Uh, there's prepare, which, you know, preparedness is something now that seems to be the word being used six months ago it was resilient and I think resilient now has a subtext of being just you know be strong and face it or you know pick yourself up by the bootstraps kind of resilience it, it, I know that's really raw and basic but that's kind of the dirty tone that it's taken on because we're all being told in in the areas of uh, where it's of disaster is like well you know it'd be great if the communities were resilient so what does that mean you know to you when you're in it um so preparedness is the thing and I think you know I'm going to touch on what Scotia said about you know in government terms you know longevity of recovery is two to three years you know in talking to arts funders and and, you know, creaking open the door and looking at other funders around the arts and cultural sector, it's, you know, yes, we're, we're kind of, we're being told, take the money while you can get it and because uh, it won't be there again. So, you know, in, in terms of recovery and how long is that linear look at it, uh, you know, what do we bank all this money and then try and, you know, ease it out? There, there's got to be a different way of looking at this process. Uh, through all of it. And so the other words that came out of the forum was influence. Basically, that means advocating uh, work, you know, creating opportunities, have, having the potential of being able to work uh, and then being more equitable, and you know, in coming out of this, thinking differently, you know, and, and setting the road to, to thriving, but thriving differently. You know, it's 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 just switching and us thinking differently about how we operated before. You know, at the moment, there's um, I'm working with a lot of artists and groups around their preparedness plans and getting uh, you know, so they're expected to put in preparedness plans if they're staying where they are and rebuilding. How do they know how to do that? You know, how do how does an artist who you know does uh, who is, is a public artist who does outdoor sculptures how do they know to have a preparedness plan what is their flood mitigation and risk mitigation plan I mean these people went to art school they didn't go to you know so in a way we've got to think differently and open that thing up and have 
consultants or people that do do this and do know this to be able to work alongside this sector and the community. I think um, there's been a lot, you, you know, the bucket of, of skill has, is expected to be bigger and bigger and that's hard. And, and so for us, you know, things like these webinars, having connections into, into um, the National Resilience, and I'm sorry, Sandy, I can't remember the new name for it because it's changed three times now. Four, actually, Jane. Four, sorry. Uh, you know, having connections into there because that's where the skill is. You know, that, that, that helps. And, and thinking differently, like, yes, let's work together, let's walk side by side and, and do it together. Yeah, and, and can I just pick up on Jane's point? I mean, uh, yeah, the expectation of what preparedness looks like, and certainly I don't um, translate that to mean on an individual level. You know, there's, there's a focus on community-led recovery and preparedness. So it's my understanding that the current thinking around that is knowing what we get that we get the best outcomes for communities when response recovery and risk reduction is community-led. But what does that actually mean? It's about recognising the level of authority of community experience and knowledge. So that becomes an embedded part of how we deal with disasters and emergencies and crises in our communities. I think it's about recognising that policy needs to be designed with this in mind, that it's really inclusive of localised knowledge and experience, and that ensures that communities can have a seat at the table. So yeah, I think again, using that language around expecting an artist to have a flood mitigation plan and to be prepared is certainly stretching the boundaries and parameters of, of what anyone is, should the expectations of any individual, but collectively, if we can call on that knowledge and that experience and how, how we can start to recognize that we need to better resource people too that often the majority of challenges that communities are grappling with is undertaken with limited paid resources and the work that's required may be undertaken by volunteers and there's mountains of goodwill, but in actual fact, do we need to have that sort of remuneration so that we can have that collective experience and skill and knowledge base that is recognised in these situations and that will really ups, you know, better prepare us in that sense. Yeah, engineers, you know, architects, you know, psychologists. <laughs> yeah, it's also um, it's also understanding our capacity to connect with the networks too. Like we have a whole raft of people, a lot of them volunteers in places like the SDS and Rural Fire Brigade, or etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who have those skills and are very keen to share them. So you know, how do we start to build some? Of these kind of localized relationships to in terms of where that capacity is so that you know, we can bring in that level of expertise not not just the bigger kind of national or state expertise and maybe you know part of part of what we talk about preparedness is just actually having relationships <laughs> or yeah true I, I, relationships I, I sort of want to throw an example out here. There's an artist that I, I know who, you know, lost studio, want to go back in there, really commit, you know, has a commitment to this region, history of this region, you know, um, this is their life. Uh, a leather worker also, um, like, really detailed work, but, you know, soldering and welding, uh, bought a horse float, and also sells, you know, direct to public. So bought a horse float and is currently working. I'm working with them to get, that's that's part of the preparedness. So I bought a horse float to be able to, everything's now on wheels. It's all, all the all the materials that was in that, were in that studio, uh, you know, plywood, all being replaced. So it's all thinking about, you know, what can be, if, if, flood mitigation comes in, then things can get wheeled out onto the horse float. And the horse float is important because it's got a ramp and then can also be used to go and do workshops as well into the community. So smart thinking, however, you know, what is, it sits in a, um, a studio with six other people. They can't do that. So it's about that thing, like I'd love to pair them up with some sort of 
uh, you know, industrial designer, engineer, or the uni or something to, to think about how um, flood mitigation, those techniques can work because the artist knows what they're doing the best, but they don't know about, you know, the other world of pre preparedness or industrial design. So that's kind of where I think it would work really well is um, having those networks and uh, and I and and for us as Arts Northern Rivers, I you know we're trying to develop some sort of register where artists can go to and be able to connect with people that can help them around consultancy preparedness, um, even just you know having initial chats around that. Thank you so much, um, Jane. For I, I was just thinking about the the register. I know that that's um, there was a register done in uh, Gunnada in terms of a community register, and and obviously that's now going to be crucial right in this instance. So that, that's really really important in terms of that connection. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about this um, inclusive uh, policy um, that Sandy mentioned, um, maybe Scotia, this is this is where the disconnect between community and emergency management services can um, can kind of fill that gap. If there was some sort of inclusive policy that that somehow um, went between the two, that that can maybe um, some sort of a uh, well, you need you need yeah, you need a um, an incentive for people to connect, particularly when you're thinking about politics. So currently, there are two policies. Uh, to uh, policies that are being developed federally, which will be really key to this, I think, into the future. Because once you've got something in policy, you've got something to point to and say you've got to put money behind it too. And if you really want something to be um, developed, like these things that Jane's talking about in terms of training or support or preparedness planning initiatives, etc. If you have something you can point to a policy, then there's we've got more traction to be able to argue our position. So mm -hmm. the um, cultural policy that's being developed currently at the moment, Australian National Cultural Policy, um, we have a good hope that written into that will be a, a mandate around uh, a connection into disaster management. And at the same time, the second national action plan, which has been developed by um, the National Emergency Management Agency that Sandy sits in, is um, going to be released at the same time. And, and we are pretty confident that we'll have arts and culture segmented into that. So, you know, in terms of opportune, that we've got these two cross-disciplinary policies talking to each other. There's much more traction and potential for us to be able to um, beat on the door and insist on some sort of um, engagement with that. So, you know, it works both ways. We have to we have to be able to escalate our ask into sort of a bigger, broader political conversation as well as being able to maintain and manage those conversations at the lower level. And that's where I think, you know, we all we all play a part, don't we, in terms of how we share and connect and resource each other to be able to manage to gather that conversation of data and experiences and um, look to kind of the long lens I suppose these things don't change quickly systems change takes a long time and as Sandy said these these words and languages have been shifting and I've been working in the disaster management field for probably 12 years now and I have to say that's been instrumental shifting that time towards towards recognizing the skills of local people and particularly creative people and the idea of how we can um, work much more collectively much more relationally within this a space which is so primary you know we if we don't have deep notion of relationship and have a look at we include a kind of emotional lens around um, the way that we move forward then you know we're still going to be very much called command structure and that's that's not going to function we can't continue to hold that with any um, real uh, development or support absolutely thank you um, Dr. Tracy has popped onto the screen. Tracy, did you want to add something from the chat box? Uh, no, I don't. But I and I'll just make the comment that uh, a lot of the time in these sort of sessions, there'll be a lot of comments. Uh, very few comments. Um, an interesting one from John about psychological traumatization and the need for preparedness, um, and, and referring it as he does in the process to the long 
uh, the long time it takes. But I, I just would make the comment myself that I think the lack of comments and questions is indicative of the, um, the depth of the discussion um, that our panelists are, are bringing tonight. Um, I think we, we are quite literally hanging on every word because you all have such experience and, um, and insights into this. So no questions at the moment coming in. Right, thanks Tracy. I would uh, thank you so much for um, really digging deeper into the idea of, of recovery. Um, and I was writing some of these, these words down that the repair influence and preparedness and thinking about when you were talking, Jane, I could feel the weight of the artist, the weight of the burden of the artist that was being asked for um, as a really physical palpable thing. So thank you for drawing that to us, um, drawing attention to that because it is, it is really important in that collaborative nature of working um, across industry and uh, as you're saying with different experts Scotia and, and Sandy um, policy as well I think there's so much in um, what we're talking about um, interestingly you, you know you, you've said that you um, Scotia and Jane both said you're not experts but there's the amount of experience that you've had to that you have gleaned having to grapple with all of this has led you to have such an expertise in the field. Um, and I just wanted to, but I just wanted to go back to something. We've um, got a uh, just under 10 minutes remaining. Um, I just want to go, um, I think Sandy mentions the process, processes and mechanics of care, um, which I thought was such a beautiful way to talk about how the arts are part of, um, let's not call it recovery, part of a healing. Part of life. <laughs> yeah, part of life, good. Um, and I just wondered, that that really stuck with me um, in terms of the compounding impacts that, that communities are forever going through. Um, I just just wondering if there's anything else that anyone wanted to add in terms of processes and mechanics of care. I, I, I'm going to, uh, we did a project in 2019, actually Charlotte, I can see Hayward is on this uh, webinar, uh, post bushfires in Ratville, which is in the Clarence, uh, well actually it's in Richmond Valley, and, um, and a really traumatised community, really small but really traumatised, the fire just ripped right through it, um, and we did a COVID, we did a project there, COVID interrupted that, and then and it 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 just shifted and you know evolved to the project while we were doing it. But it was probably one of my first experiences of the arts in a community uh, that really, really did help the community recover in terms of the community turned around and looked at each other and started sharing their experiences. And I know Sandy has got a lot of things to say around this. She, she, we're able to share their trauma in a context or in a you know an arts environment with this kind of arts happening a, a, around them that created a safe space. And um, that was just a really fragile but beautiful and palpable experience in working on that project and um and obviously it doesn't solve their their stages of recovery you know but it certainly helps them see see things through a, a lens that is well they you know the, 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 these guys were you know they're big farmers you know they came in you know hands that could pick up a teacup and the saucer you know and they came in and they were looking at the photos. They had written poems that they were performing and, uh, you know, there was tears and it was okay because it was couched in the arts. So that was really valuable and, um, and I think that's something that arts and culture in, in trauma is critical and I think that's what you know, the Creative Recovery Network sort of understand and do so well. Um, and, 
you know, sort of translating that, putting that into policy and everything is really quite difficult to take that to the, take that to, you know, a very black and white kind of logistical framework of emergency management. Thank you for sharing that, Jane. That's really um, quite palpable. It's really beautiful. And and as you say, that, that going between um, policy and then heartfelt what's happening on the ground and, and um, a healing process for communities and for individuals. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, so I would love it if, um, if all the panel would like to say a final word, a final few words, um, that would be beautiful. Um, what you've picked up on today, um, I would just say for me, it's, it's been about um, that connection, the coming together and the ability to thrive or almost re-thrive if, if that's a possible word um, in terms of um, a successful recovery, whatever that is, that ongoing healing process. Um, and Scotia, the, the, um, you brought up living on country, which I think is really precedent. So thank you for doing that. Can I ask you any um, sort of final words from anyone? I'll kick that off, Sally, with um, just, just my own personal experience and the work I'm involved with, which is touring to small communities who don't necessarily have access to live entertainment. And that absolutely is all about bringing the community together, allowing them to take a breath and reconnect. It is about allowing that rejuvenation and allowing them to replenish. And there is a model that I've been to, I'm not going to claim it, but um, I've been using for a long time, which is also taking in some um, um, professionals in mental health, counsellors, you know, primary healthcare nurses. So working in, in multiple layers and, and always ensuring that there are, we have professional counselling available at these events. And to my great pleasure, we've seen that this has been accessed in ways that from my own personal experience, only the arts and that cultural experience can bring out that responsive, just almost or organic way of connecting with others who they may not necessarily have reached out to in any other context. And that's been really successful. I'd like to see that continue. And I'd really like everybody to say, stay safe in these current circumstances. Thank you, Sandy. Scotia? Um yeah, last words, always hard, isn't it, to make a summation. But uh, interestingly, I've got this quote from Brian Eno up on the wall here. It's just a new one that I've come across, which I really liked. And he said, um, stop thinking about artwork, artworks as objects and start thinking about them as triggers for experience. And, you know, that's truly what everyone has talked about tonight. And, you know, for me, um, as much as it is a kind of complex word, this idea of preparedness, but I think it's a really key thing that we have to focus on. It's inevitable that we have to be thinking about living our lives in this uh, time of climate change and um, how we do that and how we get support to do it is a really key um, focus for our organisation. I'm really happy to help work and build up ideas of how we do that better with everyone online and also, um, yeah, again, I think uh, we always have to come back to the relationship. You know, that's the reason why we're here. <laughs> the reason why we connect us, the reason why we do our work. So how do we embed and care for each other? Thank you, Scotia. It's really beautiful. Um, thanks, Brian Eno, as well. <laughs> Jane, did you want to add anything to that? No, I... Oh, and New South Wales for hosting and yourself and my esteemed people, other Sally, um, Sally yourself, Scotia and, and Sandy and everyone else here. Thank you. So thank you. I'll just, just to wrap up, thank you very much for Regional Arts New South Wales um, for presenting the panel. Dr Tracy Callanan, thank you for managing our chat box and our beautiful esteemed speakers. Thank you, Scotia Monkovic, Jane Fuller, Sandy McNaughton for all your words and insights and experience in arts and cultural healing, shall we say. Uh, thank you um, to the audience um, for your participation. And we look forward to having you back here for another episode of The Country Air in November. 
So thank you all and good night. Thank you all.